Tanabe set off at once, cruising submerged until the sun had set. Then he said, we ran on the surface for a while, but not at top speed because I was afraid we might miss the enemy in the blackness. It was 5.30 in the morning when one of my lookouts sighted the enemy carrier. She was a big shape on the horizon about 12 miles away. I-168's crew leaped to their battle stations. Stand by to dive, shouted Tanabe. Come right to new course 045 dive. After he was inside his submarine's hull, he ordered, level off at 90 feet. Slow to six knots, six nerve-stretching hours followed, while I-168 slowed almost to a creep, worked her way into attack position. She eased off on her engines until her screws were barely making three knots. Every 30 minutes, Tanabe brought I-168 up to periscope depth so he could take a quick look at the situation. His periscope was never up for more than five seconds, but he was able to get a clear impression of what was happening. One ship, which he thought to be a destroyer, had the aircraft carrier in tow. He could see three more destroyers, so he assumed that there were at least two more on the carrier's other side, patrolling against submarines. The destroyers were about one mile out from the carrier, which convinced Tanabe that if he got off a shot at the carrier, they would surely sink his boat in the counterattack. Still, he pressed on. That aircraft carrier was too important a prize to let escape. He changed course a few degrees to the right from time to time, having noticed that the Yorktown was making some headway under her toe and moving east. I-168's sound man told his captain that the American destroyers were operating their sound equipment, but a little after 11am their pinging could no longer be heard. This puzzled Tanabe, but he kept his voice light as he told his crew. The Americans seemed to have interrupted their war for lunch, and a crew member answered, we shall give them some torpedoes for dessert. The next time Tanabe put up his periscope for a quick sweep, he found himself inside the destroyer screen. Two destroyers were abaft his beam, one about thousand yards to starboard, the other an equal distance to port. He was now heading straight for the carrier's centre and should have given the order, make ready to fire. Instead, he stunned his crew by calling out down periscope, right twenty degrees rudder, Tanabe's men must have thought he had gone mad, but they obeyed his orders even before he began an explanation for his actions. I-168's captain had been so intent on getting safely past the American escort ships that he had actually let himself get too close to the Yorktown. Now he was afraid that the run of his torpedoes would be too short to arm them, since it took several hundred yards to do that. What he had to do was make a complete circle and get back on his original track. But he wanted to end up further away from the carrier when his circle was completed, so he eased off the rudder as I-168 started to come around. The submarine made a wide circle, taking about an hour to do so, while her crew, in bare feet or thin cotton slippers, kept near total silence. I-168's periscope did not again appear above the surface until she was almost back on her original approach course. While he waited, Tanabe outlined a special plan to his torpedo officer. I-168 at that time did not mount the giant Model 95 torpedoes with their 890 pounds warheads. Tanabe's boat was armed with Model 898S, whose warheads carried only 649 pounds of explosive. He had an idea, as he put it, for making 95s out of my 89ES. The usual spread for torpedoes was two or three degrees between their paths. Should I... 168 fire full salvo from her four forward tubes, the total spread would be nine degrees. But I wanted to concentrate my punch in the carrier's centre, he said, rather than spread it out along her hull. So I planned to fire my torpedoes in pairs, with a two degree spread for each pair. Furthermore, I planned to fire tubes one and two first, then send torpedoes from tubes three and four right behind them, in their wakes. If all went well, those four torpedoes would hit very close together and do maximum possible damage to the enemy ship. By 1pm of June 6th, Tanabe was squared away on his original track, but the American destroyers appeared to have no knowledge of his presence. I have since read that a thick blanket of oil, seeping from the damaged Fiat top, may have affected performance of enemy sound equipment, rendering it practically useless. Ready to fire, Tanabe began to plan his escape after the attack, 
The wakes of his torpedoes, which were not of the oxygen-propelled type and therefore could be easily seen, would reveal his position. Men on board the carrier would know at once where they came from, though it would do them little good by that time. He called out fire and the torpedoes raced out ahead of him, while he kept his periscope above the water to observe their results. Nearly a full minute passed before the first torpedo struck. A hit, Tanabe shouted, and someone else in the conning tower responded with Banzai. Others called out, We did it, we did it, as they heard more explosions follow the first one. Go ahead at full speed, ordered Tanabe. Dive to 200 feet. The submarine lurched forward and downward, and Tanabe soon called out, Slow to three knots. He planned to get squarely beneath the carrier if possible, then make a turn toward her stern and escape under cover of explosions above him. He had seen a fifth destroyer nestled alongside the carrier, and felt that no depth charges would be fired for fear of killing any men who might land in the water. Once below the Yorktown, Tanabe swung his rudder left and began creeping past her stern. The American destroyers were on him at once, three appeared to be attacking him, one holding his position on its sound equipment while the other two made depth charge runs. These ships should have killed I-168, but Yahachi Tanabe led a charmed life. Each time his sound man reported an enemy ship making its run, Lieutenant Commander Tanabe would swing his boat around to a course opposite that of his attacker. Most of the time this resulted in the Americans overrunning him, all depth charges dropping into the water well aft of I-168's stern. The enemy was clever enough not to stay with one tactic for too long. Two hours passed without much more damage done to I-168 than a good shaking up. Then one destroyer dropped a pattern of depth charges short. They exploded very near I-168's bow. All lights went out at once, says Tanabe. And a few seconds later, my forward battery room was reporting water leaks. These could cause chlorine gas to form, killing the crew of 104, for whom Tanabe had only ten gas masks on board. Lieutenant Gunichi Mochizuki, the electrical officer, took the masks and a few crewmen and went into the battery room. His party disconnected the flooded batteries, eliminating this danger. Then word of another danger was passed from the forward torpedo room. The outer and inner doors of torpedo tube number one had been sprung by the blasts, he says, and water was coming into the boat. Unless it could be stopped, I-168 would become bow-heavy, sink below her safe operating depth, and be crushed by sea pressure along with all of us in her. Crewmen finally sealed off the damaged torpedo tube with wedges, dowels, and whatever else they could lay their hands upon. The immediate danger was averted. But we were still down by the bow because of the water we had taken aboard, says Tanabe. So I used tactic other submarines were to use throughout the war. I sent forward all crewmen who could be spared. Each one of them picked up a sack of rice or a box of provisions and carried it aft, going back again for another. That tactic helped Tanabe get his boat back on a fairly even keel by the time electrical power was restored. By then, I-168 had been cruising submerged for nearly 12 hours. Her batteries and air supply were low because of the manoeuvring done while dodging depth charges. She would soon have to surface to recharge batteries and to replenish her air tanks. From 3.30 in the afternoon, the depth charges had been coming down less and less often and in smaller groups. Tanabe decided that the Americans were hoarding what depth charges they had left. Actually, a few more all-out attacks might have caused I-168 to broach out of control, an easy target for gunfire. The same depth charge that had sprung her torpedo tube doors and caused flooding of battery cells had also made her surge nearly 100 feet toward the surface, temporarily helpless. Tanabe had five pistols and ten rifles in his small arms locker. He issued these and ordered his deck gun crew to stand by near the conning tower, so they could get on deck quickly. Sunset was not far off. If he could avoid the enemy ships for a little while longer, he hoped to surface after dark, run a while to recharge his batteries and air, then make another dive. He still had plenty of torpedoes, with five tubes left for firing them, and intended to make a fight of it. In the dark, he felt, his submarine might have an advantage, even though outnumbered. A long lull occurred in the enemy's fire. Tanabe decided his chance had come, his sound man having reported only very weak propeller sounds. Surface, 
he ordered, and began running west at 14 knots, the best speed I-168 could make while taking in air and recharging her batteries. Far to the east, beyond the horizon, he was sure an enemy aircraft carrier was sinking. He had seen his torpedoes strike into her and explode, not as far to the east, however, were the three destroyers. They were about six miles astern of him, heading away from him at a good speed. Two came about in pursuit, and a race against time began. With their superior speed, the destroyers were sure to overtake Tanabe before long. He had to stay free long enough to let his men get I-168 ready for a dive. Make smoke, he ordered, and a great billowing black cloud soon streamed over his stern. He used it for cover. It helped for a little while, and the first shells from the destroyers landed nowhere near him. The Americans had started shooting at a range of four miles, seemed too excited to shoot straight at first, perhaps because they wanted revenge so badly, but they soon became more accurate. Before long, Tanabe's boat was straddled by a salvo of shells. It was merely a matter of time until an alert gunnery officer walked shots back and forth across him for a direct hit. That would mean the end of I-168. I can remember the moment of that straddle most vividly, says Tanabe. Men on deck began darting quick looks at me, their faces taut and pale. They were anxious to get back inside the hull and for I-168 to dive. Only their long training and discipline kept them at their posts, just as it kept me at mine. I could also detect a note of strain in the voices of the men below as they called up reports. Those men, intent on dials and gauges, knew we had to stay on the surface long enough to give our boat a fighting chance, but they also wanted to get beneath the surface, away from enemy guns. I held off as long as I dared, then shouted down, Have you enough air and power for short-time operations? Yes, came the rapid answer. Then stand by to dive, Tanabe yelled, ordering his gun crew and lookouts below. He followed them down the hatch and tried another ruse to fool the trailing destroyer men. He ordered the rudder put full over, reversed his course while still on the surface and dived while heading straight at his pursuers. Because of the black smoke, they couldn't see what he was doing, as Tanabe hoped the destroyers ran right over him, and I-168's crewmen enjoyed a few moments free of fear. The destroyers located him again after a while, but fired only a few more depth charges before breaking off their attack. The enemy faded off Tanabe's sound equipment to the east. He assumed that they had been summoned back to the carrier, possibly to help pick up survivors. In any case, his ship was spared. By carefully husbanding his fuel supplies, Tanabe was able to make it back to Kure via a northern route, heading first for Hokkaido, veering south for Yokosuka, then to Kura. He deliberately passed up the shorter trip to Truk in case the enemy were still searching for him. A great crowd awaited I-168 at Kura. Tanabe was hailed as a national hero, he was immediately given command of a new submarine, I-176, together with the privilege of hand-picking the crew for it. His experiences in I-168 made him pick men with lots of factory machine experience as civilians. The wise choices he made were to save his life and his new submarine later. The battle for Midway was over. Japan had lost four of its first-line aircraft carriers, a heavy cruiser, 300 aircraft with most of their airmen, and 2,000 sailors. This proved to be the turning point of the war, even though the Americans also suffered very severe losses in planes and pilots, plus a carrier and a destroyer. America could never have made its assault on Guadalcanal two months later, had it not known that Japan's carrier air power had been sorely weakened in the June battle. When the combined fleet returned to Japan, the crews of its ships were restricted to their vessels for weeks. Even flag officers like Rear Admiral Raiso Tanaka had to remain on board, for fear that word of the awful defeat might leak out. The wounded were taken from their ships at night and secluded in hospitals with no visitors allowed. Publicly, the High Command put a bold face on things, releasing the following communique. Imperial General Headquarters, June 10th, 3.30pm, Imperial Navy units operating in the Eastern Pacific repeatedly raided Dutch Harbour and enemy key points in the Aleutians on June 4th and 5. On June 5th, they vigorously attacked Midway Island in the centre of the Pacific, inflicting heavy losses on the American fleet and air units in that area. 
In effective cooperation with the Imperial Army units, the Navy has captured key points on the Aleutian Islands since June 7th. The battle in that sector is still going on. The results ascertained to date are as follows. In Midway area, one American aircraft carrier of the Enterprise class and one American aircraft carrier of the Hornet class were sunk. Approximately 120 enemy planes were shot down in air battles. Military key points were blown up. In Dutch Harbour area, 14 enemy planes shot down or destroyed on the ground. One large transport was sunk. Two groups of petroleum and a larger hangar were caused to burst into flames. Losses to the Imperial Navy were one aircraft carrier. Another aircraft carrier and a cruiser were badly damaged, and 35 planes have yet to return to their bases. The truth was not very long in getting out. Men could not be held on board their ships forever, and in a few weeks word spread through the fleet of our terrible losses. The news spread among the citizenry after that, but not much happened. Top officials could show that Japanese garrisons were almost everywhere. The great victory in the Philippines over an army of 100,000 men was still fresh in all minds, Corregidor having surrendered in May and the public still believed the communique issued after the Battle of the Coral Sea. It had listed two American aircraft carriers, one American battleship, and one destroyer as having been sunk. It also claimed heavy damage to a British battleship, an Australian heavy cruiser, and an American heavy cruiser of unidentified class. It reported that 89 enemy planes had been shot down, while admitting only the loss of a small Japanese aircraft carrier. But, so far as the Japanese public was concerned, all seemed to be going well. They continued to endure the hardship of rationing, just as they had been doing for the previous three years, well before the war started. They did not know that all the damage 125 Japanese warships had been able to do in the Pacific, outside of a few bombings, was sink the aircraft carrier Yorktown, destroy a Hammond and two merchant ships SS Coldbrook, 5,104 tonnes, and SS Coast Trader, 3,286 tons. I give Commander Minoru Yokota and I-26 credit for this last vessel, sent to the bottom off the US West Coast. I will now indulge in what the Americans call Monday morning quarterbacking. After the Battle of Midway, the staff of Admiral Yamamoto got along much better with members of the Naval General Staff, chiefly because the defeat made combined fleet staff men a lot less arrogant. But Midway should have been a victory. Over 200 Japanese ships were employed in this effort. Some have written that American intelligence efforts really won the battle. This is not true. Others have put the blame on Admiral Yamamoto, saying he should have kept his vast naval strength together, crushing the Americans with it when they met. Yamamoto is blameless. He did what was right. He kept his main body in position where it could move to back up either his northern or southern forces, Aleutians or Midway, if either were attacked. American carrier admirals, who have the advantage of speaking from victories, they won only when they finally outnumbered the remaining Japanese carriers, and had learned many lessons from men other than themselves, say that Yamamoto should have put his main body among his carriers, so it could provide anti-aircraft protection for them. Had this been done, they say, Nagumo's ships would not have suffered so much harm in just one dive-bombing attack. It is true that these men employed their battleships in company with their carriers, but I suggest that it might have been more because they had to, rather than that they wanted to. In the first years of the war, the Americans had to make do with what they had. It is to their credit that they refined the carrier battleship task force into a mighty weapon. Again, however, one should look at the list of ships America could use in front-line battle during 1942-3, before deciding whether battleships with carriers was an invented or a necessary development of naval warfare. Nagumo has been attacked for his indecisiveness. Of this charge, he certainly was guilty. A look at the Pearl Harbor and other attacks he led provides evidence to support this verdict. On December 7, 1941, Nagumo sent half of his air strength in and kept the other half ready for a repeat attack. This second half was also ready to attack enemy aircraft carriers, should they appear, and while the second half was over Pearl Harbor, the first half was on flight decks, arming and refueling for a strike against any naval force sighted. Four months later, when the Nagumo force hit Colombo Salon, the same tactic was used, 
one wave went in while another stood by. The first wave was en roulée to target when scouts reported the presence of British capital ships. Without hesitation, Nagumo sent off his second wave against these new targets. It sank the British cruisers Cornwall and Dorsetshire. A few days after that, Nagumo attacked British shipping in the harbour of Trincomalee, Ceylon. Again he had a second wave ready, and again a scout reported the presence of a second force, this one including an aircraft carrier. And again, without any hesitation, Nagumo launched his second wave against a second target. Those planes sent the carrier HMS Hermes and HMS Vampire, a destroyer, to the bottom. The general impression has been that American flyers were the first to sink a carrier from a carrier, and that the Battle of the Coral Sea was the first time a battle was fought without the opposing ships coming within sight of each other. This impression is, of course, wrong. HMS Hermes, a light carrier, was sunk by Japanese flyers a full month before the Coral Sea battle in the first such engagement. Now then, since he had twice done so earlier, why did not Nagumo send off his ready aircraft against the American ships in the Midway battle when they were first sighted? And there is a much more important question to be asked than why Yamamoto spread his strength so widely and why Nagumo hesitated. Neither question would have to be asked had the enemy been located earlier. So I ask, why were submarines not used properly in the first place, since they held the actual key to success at Midway? For the attack on Pearl Harbor, a total of 14 submarines were used in a screen. I was executive officer in one of them, I-15, cruising in line abreast with 10 other submarines, 300 miles ahead of Nagumo. Three other submarines were just 50 miles ahead of him. Had this simple tactic been repeated during the approach to Midway, with the line of submarines swinging to the eastward on Nagumo's flank, surely some submarines would have sighted the American carriers. Commander Iura was correct, of course, in his low estimate of Subron 5's ability. Tokyo planners should have listened to him. A moderate change in plans could have sent newer and more powerful submarines out far earlier to form that sentry line between Pearl Harbor and Midway. They would have discovered the Americans lurking on Nagumo's flank, would have alerted Nagumo and probably sunk some of them too. Because it wasn't done at Midway, what Admiral Yamamoto feared did happen. The enemy came in from the flank, catching our forces by surprise, and Japan lost the bulk of a naval air strength, which, to that point, had been responsible for nearly all of its victories. The master plan to close off more than half of the world's waters to the enemy was wrecked, and it all happened purely because those planning the midway assault did not give enough attention to establishing early contact with the counter-attacking force. Again and again, this lesson of poor employment of submarines at Midway would later be brought home to us. American submarines, on many occasions, reported movements of our forces early and struck at them as they passed, using the basic strategy we ourselves had been practising for in the pre-war years, one third of all Japanese warships sunk went down before the torpedoes of submarines under Vice Admiral Charles A. Lockwood, commander of U.S. underwater forces in the Pacific. Apparently, he and his staff had far less trouble convincing their seniors how submarines should best be employed in war, except for heavy accent on how many of our merchant ships they sank in the war. The full role of American submarines against us has never been properly explained. They won the Pacific Naval War for America. Some of the Japanese submarines with the Aleutians force went on to the west coast of America after the Midway Battle. I-26 shelled a Canadian telegraph station at Estowan Point, Vancouver, on June 20th. On the next day, I-25 shelled Fort Stevens, Oregon, with Commander Tagami shrewdly taking his boat in and out through a fleet of fishing boats. This made detection and pursuit of him very difficult for the enemy, the midget carrying submarines off Sydney continued to operate in those waters and reported several sinkings. On June 1st, 8, I-21 bombarded the city of Newcastle, Australia. It was the other group of midget carriers, however, that sent in the best news. After severely damaging a British battleship and sinking a tanker at Diego Suarez, they moved north and covered the Suez Canal exits. I-10 especially enjoyed great success, all told, these submarines sank more than 20 enemy ships in the two months following the Midway Battle. I graduated from Submarine Commander's School at the end of June, 
with orders to take over command of Row 101, a brand new medium-sized submarine. Just before I finished the course, our class received some startling news. We did not fully realise it at the time, but it was the true turning point of the war for Japan's submarine power, just as Midway was the true turning point for our naval air power. I-1, I-2, I-3, I-4, I-5, I-6 and I-7 had been dispatched from home waters to support the thrust into the Aleutians. On June 21, while patrolling in a very thick fog which made visibility almost zero, I-5's deck watch suddenly found themselves showered by enemy shells, some of which came dangerously close to hitting their submarine. I-5's captain ordered a crash dive at once, and the sub just barely escaped annihilation. This was the first indication that the Americans had radar in their ships and could use it to control gunfire. Radar was to prove a big factor in the defeat of my country, and the most ironic thing about it is that the Americans, for all their reputation for inventiveness, got the heart of their radar from Japan. Radar was not in any kind of sense an American invention or development, since the Americans got their first assistance with radar from the British, who were reluctant at first to share this secret with their proposed allies. Dr. Hidenobu Yagi of Japan developed the Yagi antenna, whose principle was the heart of most radar sets used during World War II and later. He developed it long before World War II started, but no one in Japan attributed any military significance to Yagi's invention, thus proving the biblical saying that a prophet is not without honour except in his own country. The Japanese scientist accomplished this, mind you, nearly ten years before the Pacific War started. During the early 30s, Dr. Yagi visited the United States, where he delivered papers on his antenna before various scientific bodies. These papers were printed in American journals. Later, enemy scientists turned his writings to their advantage to help them in refining this electronic phenomenon. Japan, on the other hand, made no great effort to produce radar, more than two years of conflict passed before a dependable radar set appeared on board any of our warships. So, as June 1942 ended, the general news coming to us at Kure was not good, except for the accomplishments of the Indian Ocean submarines. Nevertheless, I was optimistic. I had enjoyed a few months of Hisako's excellent cooking and warm companionship, together with the gurgling company of my fine son, Shuichi and before long I would board my first submarine command, something I had been looking forward to since my days at Etajima. I had been looking forward to the day I took command of RO-101 to supervise her completion for more than a dozen years. I had high hopes for what I might accomplish with her because I was a Kagoshima boy. All my life I had been very aware of this. I still am. The place of my birth is where the Imperial Japanese Navy was also born. In June 1853, an American squadron under Commodore Matthew Perry docked at Uragamachi on Tokyo Bay. In September of that year, a Russian force of ships moored at Nagasaki, Japan, after nearly 240 years of self-imposed isolation, had her doors wrenched open to the world against her will. In my home city of Kagoshima at that time lived the daimyo Nariakira Shimazu, the noble whose family had ruled the southern section of Japan's southernmost main island for generations, using samurai warriors to control it. Of all our people, Lord Shimazu knew most about foreigners. Kagoshima City is in the prefecture state of Kagoshima, which has a long coastline, and includes many small islands. Our people were hardy seafarers, who therefore had some previous contact with the outside world. Lord Shimazu at once realised that Japan would be ravaged by foreigners unless she built adequate defences, a prediction shortly proved true by the infliction on us of unfair, one-sided treaties and the bilking of us out of our gold supplies. Jokomachi, castle towns, like Kagoshima had been for nearly 700 years, might be all right for maintaining internal security, but they meant little against a sea invasion by foreigners. Shimazu at once requested permission of Shogun Hideyoshi Tokugawa's regime to build a warship for coastal defence. Receiving it, he launched a warship the next year, mounting cannon. These were tended by samurai artillerymen from among his retainers. He helped overthrow the shogun regime and restore the emperor to his throne. But Lord Shimazu also later became involved in a civil war over attitudes toward foreigners, his ships fighting a naval battle with those of the new government. Nevertheless, 
He holds a dear place in the hearts of Kagoshima people for his effort to bring them swiftly out of the medieval and into the modern age. He opened many schools so young people could get an education, the brighter students he sent to Tokyo, and some to Europe for higher learning. He wanted to bring knowledge of Western civilization to our home. Because of Shimazu, a preponderance of modern Japan's educated men came from Kagoshima, although it was the poorest section materially of Japan, these men played important roles during the last part of the 19th century. A part of Kagoshima City near where Shimazu's castle was located is called Kajiacho. It is a very small area, even smaller than one square block of New York City, but the samurai spirit has always been strong there. This tiny place had an impact on Japan, all out of proportion to its physical size. Among the famous men born in Kajiacho was Takamori Saigo, Japan's first modern general. He played a leading role in the restoration, which culminated in 1868 with the shogun overthrown and young Emperor Meiji ascending the throne to power. Prior to that, for centuries our emperors had been figureheads, the real power being exercised by shogun, foreigner-defeating warriors, who were charged with the defence of Japan. Another famous Kajiacho man was Iwao Oyara, who helped mould a modern army out of Japan's peasant class, when the samurai were disbanded, he was senior officer in the Imperial Japanese Army during the Russo-Japanese War. A third was Toshimichi Okubo, faithful servant of the Meiji government and contributor to the first parliamentary system of rule in Japan. A fourth was Tamasada Kuroki, general in the war with Russia. A fifth was Gombei Yamamoto, who became navy minister during the war with Russia and was twice prime minister, as well as attaining the navy rank of admiral and there was still another man who came from this tight cluster of homes in Kajiacho, still idolised in Japan. He was Heihachiro Togo, who defeated one force of Russian ships, then completely destroyed or captured a second force, sent more than halfway around the world to defeat him. His flagship at the Battle of Tsushima Strait, UN Mikasa, was restored in Yokosuka as a national shrine during the 50s. An American who greatly admired Togo was Fleet Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, USN, who lent his great name in an effort to remind our people of their great naval traditions through IJN Mikasa. Nimitz compared Togo's flagship with HMS Victory and with USS Constitution, the old Ironsides of which America is so proud. I was born on March 20, 1910. Throughout my boyhood and young manhood, I strove to be as much like Admiral Togo as possible, especially in physical accomplishment and stamina. So, I think, did every other Kagoshima boy. Togo's father was a samurai, who gave his son an extremely Spartan example to emulate. The younger samurai excelled not only in studies, but in fencing, swimming, sumo wrestling, hiking and mountain climbing. When he was only 17, he helped fight off a British force that shelled Kagoshima in reprisal for the killing of two Englishmen near Yokohama. Togo enlisted in Shimazu's navy at 19 and fought in two naval battles not long afterward. When he was 26, the national government sent him to England, where he studied the ways of a modern fleet. His victory over the Russians on May 27, 1905, at Tsushima Strait, northwest of Kyushu, electrified the world especially the Japanese people. Suddenly Japan in less than 40 years had leapt forward 400 years. In 1867 her warriors wore suits of armour and fought with swords. In 1905 they crouched over telescopic gun sights in steel turrets, mounted in ships so superior that British newspapers complained that British shipyards built better ships for foreigners than for the Royal Navy. The victory also affected other Asians deeply for this was the first victory over white men in that part of the world. All this was a great source of pride to the stern, tough people of Togo's hometown. It affected every activity of my youth. Each day, after grammar school classes, I went with my schoolmates, all boys, to a club. There, in an effort to be like Admiral Togo, I studied, debated and learned from older persons about our traditions, while competing with other in fencing, judo and sumo. The samurai spirit was high in us as we voluntarily performed close-order drill. We talked much about how a Japanese should be brave, be courteous and be simple in his living habits. Once a year the Imperial Combined Fleet would come to Kagoshima and anchor in the broad bay, 
swarms of people would go out to visit it. When I was eleven years old, the mighty battleship Mutsu was its flagship, and I was much impressed with the shining brasswork, the gleaming steel decks, and the immaculate messing and berthing spaces. It was a great thrill for a young boy to see those officers and sailors move briskly about their duties. I visited the very peak of the forecastle, the tip of the battleship's bow, and laid my hand on the gilded chrysanthemum carried there, the symbol of Imperial Japan. At that moment I made myself a promise. Some day, Zenji, I told myself, you are going to serve in the Imperial Navy, you will be a crew member of this mighty ship, and you will again lay your hand on this glorious symbol. I was still a student in grammar school when some war-booty German submarines were exhibited at Kagoshima. My teacher visited one and actually made a dive in it. He told us many stories about that adventure and of what the German submarines had accomplished before their nation was defeated. This and the visit to Mutsu made me feel strongly that I wanted a Navy career. Two other boys in my class were similarly influenced, Taro Ebihara, son of a retired rear admiral, and Shigeshi Kuriyama, son of a pharmacist. Commander Ebihara died on board a destroyer in the fighting for the Solomons. Lieutenant Commander Kuriyama gave his life while skippering RQ-33, just about the time I put Oro-101 in commission. I moved up to Kagoshima's middle school in 1922, a step that made my parents very proud. It was located in Kajiya-cho, near Shimazu's castle. Only top students could enter this school, which had a reputation for scholarship going back 50 years to the Restoration period. Discipline was tight, the course difficult, and the athletic programme very strenuous. I did pretty well in my studies, but actually excelled in sports, included in the curriculum, which was much influenced by the samurai spirit universal among Kagoshima people, was military training, supervised by a pair of retired army officers. Under them was a major who inspired all of us. Though he was very tough, he maintained high standards, demanded high performance, and talked often about the importance of both. The Washington Naval Disarmament Treaty of 1922 had caused Japan, like other nations, to make a radical reduction in the student bodies of its military and naval academies. That is why now is the best possible time, this man would say to us many times, for you to enter the military life. Before many years pass, men from the two academies will be the leaders of Japan's military forces, and those forces will again be much larger than they are now. Many years later I would command a submarine rushing to this man's aid at Okinawa. There, American marines and army troops would learn what a strong and disciplined fighter he was, and pay for this lesson in rivers of blood. His name was Mitsuru Ushijima, his rank then Lieutenant General. Because the Kagoshima district was so poor, few boys could get higher educations. So it was everyone's dream to win admission to the military or naval academy, Few from Kagoshima got into the military academy, which got the bulk of its cadets from Yamaguchi Prefecture, an area strongly inclined toward army life. But many were successful from near my home, an area with a long sea tradition at getting into the naval academy. In January 1928, I took the entrance examination for Etajima, Japan's Annapolis. Over 4,000 boys throughout Japan, all holding high academic standing, competed for the 130 appointments. Unlike the US, where most appointments are obtained through political influence, our academy was open to every boy in the land. Requirements were a good character, attested to by several prominent citizens, a high level of physical fitness and a high academic standing. No one who wore glasses was considered at all, nor were men who had more than a couple of teeth missing. There was but one exception to the rules. Members of the royal family could enter, provided they passed the physical examination. They did not have to take the other tests. And some members of the royal family did matriculate at Etajima, including Prince Takamatsu, brother of the emperor. The physical examination was most meticulous, the written one very severe. There were tests on eight different academic subjects, and the entire proceedings took a week. Then we all went home, nervous and irritable. All 4,000 candidates must have been impossible to live with during the next two months while they waited for the results. In spite of the tension, I enjoyed basking in the new attention given me locally. 
About 150 boys from Kagoshima took the examination that year, which in itself was a great honour. I found myself thinking that at least I had been allowed to take it, which would be some consolation should I fail to gain entrance. Then, in March of 1929, 17 other boys and myself received word that we had been selected. My back was very stiff with pride on April 4th, 1929, as I entered Etajima, my new blue uniform as yet unwrinkled, a short sword at my side. I was in the 59th class. While Annapolis men are marked by the year in which they are graduated, Japanese men used the graduating class number. My class was to be the 59th to complete the course, and I would ever after be a 59th man. On my first Sunday at Etajima, an instructor marched all 130 of us to the top of Mount Furutaka, which rose 1,000 feet behind the academy. As we stood on its crest and looked north, we could see Hiroshima. To the east was the great naval arsenal at Kure, black plumes of smoke rising from its shops. Below us lay the academy compound, and on the water between our island school and the mainland lay countless moored ships. I can still recall my main thought on that day, how the scene before me seemed divided between the artificial and the natural, the man-made ships and the lovely pine trees, sea and grass. Then I buckled clown to months of arduous schooling. Our day began at 5am and ended at 10pm, with little time spared for leisure. Our subjects included the Japanese language, mathematics, electronics, machinery engineering, astronomy, oceanology and others. In addition, we had the special naval subjects of gunnery, torpedoes, navigation, communications and engineering. The English language was a required subject for every midshipman, and we also had to study one other foreign language as well. I chose French. There were three classes, the 57th, 58th and 59th in the academy when I started there, having about 120 to 130 midshipmen in each. We were organised both horizontally and vertically. The 59th, for example, was split into four divisions. I lived, ate, slept and studied with mine. There were, of course, 12 such in the academy, giving horizontal organisation within our own graduating groups. Vertical organisation was accomplished by dividing each class into 12 sections, a section of one class, say the 59th, being combined with sections of the 57th and 58th for all extra-academic activities. Thus, a man in class 59, Division 1, Section 1, went to class with Division 1 men, but when it came time for athletics, he participated with Section 1 men of the upper classes. This gave good balance and made sports highly competitive. It also helped men to become acquainted with those seniors to them at an early date, rather than be segregated from them for three and a half years, then have to meet them for the first time on active duty. Meals were simple, so were accommodations. We had one general sleeping room and one general study room for every 30 cadets or so. All midshipmen ate in one general mess hall, which had much room to spare because classes had been so reduced in number. Our only really free times were Saturday afternoons and from 8am to 5pm on Sundays. The two half hours we had free during the rest of the week were usually given over to some extra needed study. We could leave the compound on Sundays and go into the town of Etajima, but there was no kind of diversion there at all, no stores, no tea houses or restaurants where a midshipman might want to shop or relax. What we did have there were clubs, the welfare and morale department of the academy arranged that the use of one was obtained for 30 midshipmen. We could lie around on tatumi mats, play records, take naps or stuff ourselves with sukiyaki. It seems strange, looking back over the decades, that I ever could stand such a Spartan life. Later, when I learned of it, I marvelled at how Annapolis men could have girlfriends and dates and dances, and sometimes a weekend of fun and pleasure. A three-week winter holiday and a four-week summer holiday was all the time we had off away from the academy. And even then, one's behaviour had to be most circumspect. A Japanese officer was socially acceptable anywhere, a most unusual thing in class-stratified Japan, it was a great honour to be one, or even training to be one. So, one's manners and conduct had to be above reproach at all times. Our family backgrounds, even before taking the competitive entrance examination, had been checked by the police. Becoming involved in some form of forbidden behaviour, even while on vacation, 
could mean immediate expulsion and disgrace. This was a very rare happening, however maintaining high standards of conduct was a challenge, as were other things at Etajima, like the annual boat race and annual swimming race. It gave me pride to see three sixty young bodies pulling at oars for all they were worth, and at Miyajima, where we had our annual ten-day campout just before summer vacation, the men who were not good swimmers would spend practically all of each day in the water so they could build enough stamina and skill to complete the 10,000-metre swimming race that ended the stay. Of the men who failed to graduate from Etajima, only a handful flunked scholastically. Most failures came from breakdowns in health because of our rigorous physical training. A great deal of our leisure discussion at Etajima naturally centred about sea life. At the start of my summer vacation in 1931, I decided to stop off at the Kure Naval Arsenal to see some of the real Navy. Midshipman Zen Shintoyama went along with me. We were welcomed gracefully and given a tour of the submarine school. In one corner of the grounds, Toyama and I saw an old-style submarine, on rests. It was submarine number six, recovered from Hiroshima Bay after sinking there on April 14, 1910. Beside it, encased in glass, was the final will of Lieutenant Tsutomi Sakuma, captain of the tiny submersible, written while he was waiting to die. For twenty years he had been the inspiration of Japan's small but growing submarine fleet. Japan first thought of getting submarines for its navy at the same time as America did, on March 14, 1900, when Mr John Holland demonstrated his underseas boat for Admiral George Dewey and other notables, a naval member of the Japanese embassy's staff was present. He was much impressed and at once recommended to Tokyo that Japan purchase some of these boats. On April 11, 1904, the US accepted USS Holland, SS-1, and 15 months later the first Japanese submarine performed excellently on its first sea trials, amazing the Americans who came along to provide technical assistance. They had not expected our men to master the submarine so quickly. Our government bought five of Mr Holland's boats, plus the plans for two improved models. At that time Japan had seven fine foreign-built battleships and fifteen fine foreign-built cruisers in its navy, plus five cruisers built at home. We were making our own armour plate at Kure by then, and moving rapidly ahead in sea power. Great Britain had already noticed this, and seized the chance in 1902 to effect a treaty with Japan. This action, taken only 35 years after Japan's fighting, men gave up wearing helmets and armour like the Knights of the Crusades, signified her formal entrance into the society of modern nations. Because of the alliance with Japan, Great Britain needed to keep only a small naval force in the Far East and could concentrate her main naval strength in the Mediterranean where Germany was threatening. How right Britain was in this move was shown on May 27, 1905, when Admiral Togo eliminated the only other naval power that threatened Britain's interests in Asia, Russia. Submarines seemed ideally suited for defence of our island kingdom. Between 1905 and 1914, Japan bought them from Great Britain, France, Italy and Germany, finally basing her home-built submarines on the last, which were then the world's best. During that period and for years afterward, Japan was truly the only sea power in the Orient. True, President Theodore Roosevelt sent his Great White Fleet around the world in a show of strength in 1901-8, but this impressed no one but the American newspapers. While the White Fleet cruised, Great Britain completed construction of HMS Dreadnought, which made Roosevelt's ships obsolete before they got home. Also, Japan's naval strategists noted something important about Roosevelt's force. Every bit of support for its 16 battleships had to be supplied by foreign ports and foreign ships. The Great White Fleet could not carry enough of its own fuel to fight a war with Japan. The White Fleet, in fact, because it could not even steam from Hawaii to Japan and back without refuelling, dictated Japanese naval strategy for the next 30 years. This was based on defeat of an approaching enemy by catching him with his fuel depleted, far from his support bases. Our defence strategy meant defence, not attack, which accents how novel and daring it was for us to attack Pearl Harbour. On April 14, 1910, the year in which I was born, Lieutenant Sakuma took submarine number six, 
Our submarines had numbers only until 1923 out on special trials. He was experimenting with a forerunner of the famous Schnorkel, just as Mr. Holland had. Sakuma wanted to be able to operate submerged while his gasoline-powered engine breathed air from the surface. But his boat took a sudden dip and water flooded in through his crude air intake. Before it could be closed, submarine number six was so weighted down with water that it sank. <laughs>